For many Americans, the death last summer of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, was a wake-up call about the dysfunctional relations between police and urban communities. But for many others, it only confirmed what they've known and experienced for decades. If you're black or brown, an encounter with a police officer can have disastrous consequences. Last month, the Department of Justice released a scathing report that accused the Ferguson Police Department of perpetrating a broken and racially biased system of criminal justice. And a number of observers believe Ferguson is only the tip of the iceberg. Are they right? Can our system of policing change to reflect less confrontation and more collaboration with at-risk communities? What would a 21st century police force look like? To help us answer those questions, Criminal Justice Matters is opening a conversation today about policing in the 21st century, which we hope you'll join as well. Let's start with Professor Karen Martin of John Jay, who's one of the country's leading researchers on police issues. Karen, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. The DOJ report issued a condemnation of an entire system, mm -hmm. not just the Ferguson Police Department, basically saying that they were operating um, through fines and, and, and fees a system that disproportionately impacted um, minority community, uh, communities, minority people in, at every level, mm -hmm. from the police to the courts. I can't remember the DOJ ever issuing such a systemic condemnation. Is this a problem that's limited, do you think, from to Ferguson, or do we see it elsewhere in the country? We definitely see it elsewhere. I think it is remarkable that the Department of Justice essentially indicted the court system, the city manager, the, that entire branch, and the police saying that they were essentially working in cahoots to generate revenue off the backs of people who could ill afford it. And unfortunately, this is definitely a trend we are seeing nationwide with the proliferation of court costs, fees, surcharges, and that is before you actually get to sentencing. So that's before you actually get to the thing that is supposed to be punitive, which is a fine, and in certain cases, restitution. So this is a trend that is happening at the federal level. We're up to over $3 billion a year being assessed in criminal justice financial obligations. $3 billion. Thirteen billion. Thirteen billion. Yes, over twelve billion. Um, and states, you know, New York has dozens. California has dozens of statutes that that essentially provide for a wide array of fees and fines and surcharges and mandatory penalty assessments that people have to pay. So this is a systemic problem. Yes. Um, we used to see the this kind of criticism directed towards the South alone, yeah. but now we're. The DOJ report seems to suggest that it's nationwide. How do we possibly get a handle on it? What does your research tell well, you? Well, unfortunately, my research shows that there is wide variation, not just within a state or even within a county, but even within a jurisdiction. So different courthouses will actually have different policies about what kinds of fines and fees they assess, how, how strenuously they pursue collection, the consequences for failing to pay. And so part of the problem is that we actually don't know exactly what's happening. And people are working on it. Um, researchers are working on it. And the next step is essentially to try to quantify what's the amount that people are paying, right? And that's difficult to do because it's not like there's just like kind of a database that you mm. can say, hey, what are the outstanding financial obligations, right? Because they come from so many different sources. Now, what else did you see in the report that struck you? It really was striking to me that the Department of Justice zeroed in on the fact that it was kind of cross-institution communication, right? They, they cited emails between the city manager and police executives. They cited emails um, that the city manager would then report to the city council saying, oh, wait, we're doing such a great job because we're producing more revenue. So it was this kind of complete disregard of of the fact that criminal justice debt is very difficult for people and a complete kind of myopic focus on the revenue and the potential for revenue. So I found that very striking that there is this con disconnect between what we purport we want the criminal justice system to do, right, public mm -hmm. safety, encourage mm -hmm. public safety, um, and then what's actually happening, which is actually undermining a lot of what we want the but criminal But the truth system. is, in this budget strain time, cities and counties need that money desperately and they have no place else to get it. So what do they do? So that's the question because the fundamental problem is that the criminal justice system is actually set up as a public good. We are all supposed to be benefiting from it. Usually with public goods, the public pays for it. Somehow in the criminal justice system, we have moved to this kind of consumer transactional justice paradigm where the people who quote unquote use the system are the ones who are supposed to be paying for it. But that just flies in the face of everything else that we do in government. We have you know, some precedent for people paying fees for things like parks and tolls and you know, co-pays for publicly supported childcare, for example. But 
you know, to ask the people who are somehow caught up in the system to be exclusively or primarily paying for it is just but isn't isn't counter. the idea also looking at the other side yeah. to make people feel some measure of personal responsibility or accountability for their actions. Yes, absolutely. And that is true if you're looking at just fines, right? A fine is supposed to be punitive. That completely makes sense. The problem is that fines are just one of many, many types of, cri of criminal justice financial obligations that people are confronting, right? So it's fines plus restitution, plus court costs, plus mandatory surcharges. All of those can go to different agencies, come from different agencies. So when you look at the sum, from the perspective of the person, it seems like it's just punishment is everywhere, mm. right? So people just spiral down. They spiral mostly. down. They can't actually get in ahead of this debt. So uh, let's try to figure out how we, how we can address this. The, the, the Obama administration also issued an interim report on its uh, 21st Century Task Force mm -hmm. on policing, mm -hmm. or policing in the 21st century. And in it, it talked about better community relations. It talked about, uh, in fact, 59 recommendations for how police forces themselves and city authorities can change themselves. But we have 18,000 police forces right. in the country and law enforcement agencies in the country. Uh, how are those folks going to change? if each one has to decide individually what to do. Ferguson fired uh, some of his key officials or they quit last right. month. But is firing enough? I mean, I don't enough? think necessarily firing is enough. I mean, that being said, the um, executive, you know, police organization is very hierarchical. Often the chief or supervisors do set the tone for the culture for what's going to be prioritized, right? We saw that in the report the DOJ wrote about, you know, upper level people saying this is what you need to do if you want to get a promotion essentially like you've asked about like why should I be doing this if I it's not going to get me a raise well actually yes yeah. this is how you're going to get promoted is if you bring in revenue so I do think that there's something to be said for trying to pursue some type of cultural shift which can sometimes come from switching out a leader but I do think it's more endemic than that I mean it, it requires kind of public pressure to say this is what we want policing to be we want you to support public safety we want, it, we want you to be looking out for our general welfare not just pursuing kind of institution focused security. So changing the culture. Yes. Let's 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 fix on that. In okay. New York, um, the New York City Police Department has gone a long ways towards it, it, in effect trying to change that culture. Mm -hmm. Yet there are lots of people who say it's hasn't gone far enough. We mm -hmm. have a, a community safety act that's been instituted in New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have people saying on the books that chokeholds are banned, yet mm -hmm. we saw they were being used. How effective do you think, just in New York alone, mm -hmm. the, the, this culture-changing paradigm has been? I think that it's, you know, mixed results. I think that there, it's true, there are many police officers and many police executives who want to do the right thing, right? So it's not like we are talking about an evil institution and everybody's trying to oppress everybody else all the time. That's just not the case. Um, the, the truth is that it is, can be difficult for the people who are essentially the frontline bureaucrats who are supposed to be implementing some legislation and policy that has been decided from upon high, right? There's often a disconnect between what the people on the street are doing and what the executives think they're supposed to be doing and the executives who are accountable to public more so and to, you know, people who appoint them. Right, so there can be this kind of gap between what we want to have happen and what's actually happening. Is it as simple as hiring more, uh, hiring people who reflect the community, widening the diversity, or is that just too simplistic? I think that is too simplistic. I think that it is it um, serves a purpose for in terms of people in the community kind of seeing themselves reflected. I think that's a lovely thing, but there's no evidence that actually like matching demographically police to the community does anything. That's actually a very complicated question, right? Because if you're the lone black person on the force, you can actually feel this kind of pressure to make sure that you're not seen as the, because you're black, you're being lenient on black people, mm -hmm. right? So just saying that matching demographically is not gonna cure that's anything. That's an interesting point. So if, if, if diversity alone, um, doesn't help. Right. I mean, it's obviously a factor. Uh, what does help? More training, uh, better education. Um, what are the factors that really go into changing the culture and the approach of a police force? Or alternatively, is, is it enough? Is a police force enough to change this entire systemic problem which the DOJ has identified? Well, I mean, that's a very large, complicated question, right? Like some of it is about a massive culture change. I think I, in terms of the police, I'd actually back it up a little further and go to recruitment, right? Like who are we asking to take on this job? Like what are we looking for? If you're just looking for example, military experience, which obviously has some very 
significant benefits to your ability to be a good police officer, but if that's your only focus, then you're going to be missing people who have other types of experiences, other type of education, which are also very necessary in today's policing. Well, that raises a very interesting question, because police come from a militaristic culture. Right. What makes police work attractive to some people is its sense of hierarchy, yep. uh, the fact that you're enforcing the law, yes. you're keeping order. Uh, changing that uh, potentially results in some changes that are not really that comfortable in terms of protecting public order and public safety. If you tell police that they have to be social workers or friendly or nice. I mean, you know, people who enter police, they want to help. Fundamentally, most people who are interested in policing want to help. So what helping looks like, of course, differs by the person. But to some people, being able to be the one that can, you know, help somebody in an abusive situation get out, yes, that's kind of social worky, but it's also law enforcement, right? You're not allowed to actually assault people. So I think that there are plenty of officers who are actually motivated to want to do all different types of, of ensuring public safety. Are you optimistic? Do you yes. think you can actually change? Why? Because I've seen change before, right? I mean, I, our criminal justice system is deeply flawed, but we are still incrementally kind of coming to realizations that, for example, mass incarceration isn't working out for us so well, right? That's a kind of new re realization. The trajectory, I'm sure many people know, started in the 70s and it's been exponentially increasing, and we've had bumps along the way, but I think we are now at least having a conversation that mass incarceration is not a great idea. And the fact that we are expanding our scope and starting to think about things in new ways does make me optimistic. Is there also a responsibility on the part of the community to change its approach? Right now, the, the mantra is that police in many communities, urban communities, mm -hmm. uh, poor communities, are an occupation, an occupation force, an occupying force. Mm -hmm. There's no way we can talk with them. Uh, you can talk about stop, question, frisk, or stop and shake, as some mm -hmm. people are talking about. But generally speaking, the community is so polarized over the issue, as we've seen over the last six months, that one wonders um, whether there's any ground for real discussion and real reconciliation. I think there's absolutely ground for real discussion and reconciliation. That has happened before, it will happen again. I think that every person, every human being wants to be listened to, and I think that it is incumbent upon policy institutions, political institutions, to actually do some listening, right? It needs to be a two-way street. It can't be police asserting this is what's gonna happen to you, and it also can't be the community saying this is the only thing that we wanna have happen to us, right? You actually need to have a dialogue, and I think that there's potential for that. There are people interested in doing that, and I think that that's kind the way to go. So where is your research leading to? What's, what's it going to tell so us? So my yeah. research is actually telling me that taking seriously racial bias, implicit psychological biases that we have, as has also entered the kind of news and public rhetoric recently, is the way to go. Because we all have brains, all of our brains work in a certain way. We can't change that, but we can learn to recognize our shortcomings and learn to recognize our strengths and build on the strengths, right? So it's different to like kind of be beholden to something that you don't understand, but when somebody says, you know what, everybody has implicit bias. Doesn't mean you're a bad person, doesn't mean you're quote unquote racist. Once you know that that's the case, then you can actually just take steps to deal with that. Well, right? I hope you'll come back and join us when some of that research is done Love to tell to. us all about it. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Too often a discussion about law enforcement is limited to the experts or the men and women in blue. But after the recent tragedies, communities on the front lines are beginning to make their voices heard. And perhaps the most important of those voices are young people. At John Jay, where many students are beginning careers in law enforcement and justice, those issues are especially close to home. So we've invited some of our students to provide a perspective which is often missing in the national conversation. Ed Saul Martinez and Glacey Mejia work with John Jay's community outreach team on a project in Brooklyn's Brownsville neighborhood. Carlos Gonzalez is a freshman who has conducted research on policing and community issues. Let's listen in. My name is Glacey Mejia. I'm a sophomore and I'm currently studying my criminal justice degree. And I want to become a case manager or just work with juvenile justice in the future. Hello, everyone. My name is Exaul Mendoza. I'm a sophomore at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'm doing double major and a minor. My double majors are criminal justice and management, international criminal justice, and the dispute resolution program at John Jay. And my career goals are to be part of the Nassau County Police Department, and after five or six years within the Nassau Police Department, move to the FBI as a special agent. Um, my name is Carlos Gonzalez. I'm currently a forensic psych major at John Jay. Um, my career goal would be to deliver stories through media that are current and matter. So I saw myself 
saw that there is a big need for to mend the relationship between police and the community and we thought what better way than to have that event here at John Jay and being that we are on the service council this semester we're able to coordinate the event and set it up so that it can happen and our event is focusing on bringing youth from Brownsville just to have a discussion or just a meet and greet with police and get to know the police and their work ethics and just talk a little bit about the problems they've having and the stuff that they want to see changed. It's important because um, these youth, you know, they are the future. So we want to make sure that they take the negative experience that they have but try to make something positive out of it. And they really want to have a better relationship with the police, but they just don't know how to start or where to start, or they kind of fear the police because of their experiences. I remember this one experience, and it, it's really stuck with me. It was, uh, I was walking down a uh, dark street with, um, with, my, with a friend of mine, and he was a lot darker than I am. And we were walking down, and all of a sudden I look, and I saw my friend instantly get scared. Like, he was, he tensed up, and, and you could tell. Like, when I saw his reaction, and then I saw the car that was pulling up next to me, I knew it was a, it was a, plain clothes cop so um, whatever you know I tried to play it as cool as possible but my friend did not like you could tell he just didn't know how to interact with police he was being very rude he was being um, he was talking back and it was he was just he was being very uncooperative and they actually had to come and like separate me from him and ask me listen you seem like you're a respectful guy you need to talk to your friend because if you don't talk to him, he's gonna be sent to, he's gonna be put in jail tonight. So I had to calm him down. I had to calm him down and I had to tell him, yo, they are not going to respond well to you being rude. These people are the people who have guns like right there. Like they, they, they could just say they have probable cause and then, and then they will choose, the, the courts will choose their words over yours. The first thing that I think when I see a cop, he's coming to say hi or to ask me a question. What my friend thinks, he's coming to arrest me and search me. When you talk to a police officer with respect, you're gonna get the same thing. And that's how our community should be. That's how the world is. If you talk to me with respect, I'm gonna give you back that respect. Same thing with Ed. I think they might come to question me or just, you know, say hey or something like that, but usually from my personal experience, if I smile at a police officer on the train, I usually just get a stare or I don't get a smile back. Um, but most of my friends, similar to Carlos, if they see a police officer, we can be in the supermarket, in the movie theater, they automatically don't know how to act or get scared or they mm -hmm. want to, you know, leave the area as soon as possible. I think it is the issue. My professor on the first day of class, my sociology class, asked us, um, who do you fear, your mom or the police? And everyone all said, I'm scared of my mom. So she goes, what is it about your parents that makes you have that respect and that fear for them? And of course, everyone gave their explanation, but I think um, we no longer look at police, like Ed said, to protect and serve. So I think automatically, like Carlos's friend, we don't know how to act or what to do, and our first instinct is to be um, disrespectful. But I think if we work on that, then it will change everything. Yeah, and then what about the kids who are, they just automatically, they know that they're being racially profiled because they're in a minority neighborhood. They feel like they're being disrespected by the police just by them being stopped. So how would you, what, would, what is your view on that? My view on that is that we look at the law, we say stop and speak, and we think that is the law being racist. But the law itself, when you take a law and you look into each word that are there that form the law, they're not racist. Mm -hmm. What is racist is the outcome of the law. So we need to work on that. How police are being are implementing those laws. Another thing that I wanted to add on to that is that growing up in the neighborhood I grew up, and I guess this applies for a lot of neighborhoods across America, is that you usually just tend to hear kids just mouthing off about the police, like, F the police, like, no, like, they're so, it's just like, it's a culture that's so against the police and um, I believe that that's something that really needs to change. It As Carla Glacy has said, especially that story that you have mentioned mm -hmm. about you and your friend, one of the main issues in our community is that the youth in, within our community are being disrespectful to police. 
And we don't look at police as human beings. We see them as the robots that just go around the street and work. But actually, they're human. As many of you might know, when your dad or your mom come to a baseball game, a basketball game, you feel proud. Imagine what their kids are going through when they have to work, especially during holidays, missing those important holidays. And they're actually serving our community. But what is that community doing to them? How is that community reacting? Especially in that way, imagine a police officer working 12 hours a shift, and mm -hmm. then he gets to a case where this young man is being disrespectful to him. You did mention that police, they yeah. carry gun, but in that, ex in that incident that you had with your friend, I would doubt it that the police actually were going to use their gun. No, what they no. did use was something that is amazing, and those police should be co congratulated. Mm -hmm. Because what they did, they pulled you aside, and they said, listen, you can speak to your friend. Your friend got a chance to redeem what he has done wrong. And by you speaking to him and telling him how he should be respectful to the police, if many youth within New York City start doing that, police and community relationship will be much better. Personally, I read an article that kind of brought this into my whole mental process. It was, uh, it was a reporter asking um, a well-off, wealthy Caucasian male, like, how does he feel? Basically the same question. How, how do you feel when a uh, cop pulls you over? And the, and the guy said, well, I question whether I'm being pulled over by a high school dropout with a gun. And that resonated with me because it also, it also brings in the issue of what's the level of educational attainment that really benefits the police officers? And then it's also, okay, well, lately I know that in the media, I've seen a lot of, you know, trigger friendly or, or just violent police officers being portrayed. How do I know they're not going to do that to me, you know? So I think that's something that, you know, that just everybody needs to focus on. Everybody needs to question what is the level of educational attainment that, re that is required to be a good police officer? Well, the level of education to be required to be a police officer, it varies within cities mm -hmm. and the state. That's but true. And only 1% of all police departments in the United States require that you have a college degree. And why is that? Exactly. So that's something that we as a community, exactly. as being part of a nation that focuses on freedom, we should put forward. We mm -hmm. should push for that. Why can a police officer go and get at least four years of college education. Because as you said, there are many 19 years old becoming a police officer. Mm -hmm. And those 19 years old, they don't know what they're doing. Those are the ones that are misrepresenting yeah. the police officer in our nation. And just because they're doing something bad, we are blaming the ones that are actually doing their good work. And as you yeah. might know, I'm here in John Jay, and we are in a new initiative with President Travis. I'm sitting in that mm -hmm. committee, and that's one of the topics. And I'm looking forward to push police officers to be educated, yeah. and not just be educated. Once they get educated, make sure that within their college life, they serve and work their community. Because that's the most important thing. When you get a person educated, and actually they know how to serve and work with their community, our police enforcement, our law enforcement, is gonna be one of the greatest in our nation. I think so, because on both ends, um, I know friends who want to see that change, and I, I know like maybe as an officer, you don't want to have to have that you know, stereotype on you. I think it's just not going to happen you know, overnight, obviously, but I think over time, if we take the initiative and we figure it out and have a discussion to see what needs to be done, it'll be, it'll, it can happen. I think police, officials, youth, students like us and John Jay, um, you know, get the word out and see what's the issue. You know, what is it about police that makes you scared or why do you feel stereotyped and stuff like that? And just have a discussion and figure it out. I would say that who needs to take the initiative? Let's go with the community because the community is the one that is being mistreated. And if they start working with the police, they start getting involved with what the police is doing. The police, don't, they don't have another option than just to work with the community. It's time for the community to start rising up and telling the police, you need to work with us. I mean, the only thing I would say is, you know, when I was younger, I had coloring books of badges and police on motorcycles to protect and serve, you know? 
say hi to your fellow police officer, they're your friend, not your enemy. It's, it's a two-way street. No one person is more responsible than the other. You know, it's, we definitely have to have a level of communication and, and we need to establish that trust again because the trust is it's not there anymore. The Missouri police officer who shot Michael Brown was cleared of any criminal act. The officer who choked Eric Garner to death in Staten Island also will not face a trial. These decisions angered a lot of people. But the debate they started about the role of police in our communities is long overdue. And that's something we can all agree on. At John Jay, we're doing our part. President Jeremy Travis has launched a college-wide initiative to explore building trust between cops and the community. So the conversation is just beginning, and I hope you'll join in. I'm Steve Handelman. Thanks for watching. See you next month.